of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of thy faithful, and enkindle in them the fire of your love. Send forth your Spirit, and they shall be created. And now shall the face of the earth. Let us pray. O God, who by the light of the Holy Spirit didst instruct the hearts of thy faithful, grant us by the same Holy Spirit to be truly wise and ever rejoice in his consolation through the same Christ our Lord. Amen. Okay, it's Tuesday, March 23rd, 2021. The Gospel for today comes from St. John chapter 8, verses 21 to 30. This gospel, and just um, the way that St. John's Gospels uh, narrate things, they are they're very deep and profound, and they talk a lot, a lot about St. John's Gospel talks a lot about the divinity of Jesus Christ, okay? the divine nature of Jesus Christ. And, and today, it's similar to the Gospels we read um, last week, which we weren't able to do any commentary on. But uh, it's similar in the sense that our Lord talks to the Jews about how He was the Son, is the Son of God. And He talks about His relationship with God the Father. Okay? And today, we hear more or less the same theme where our Lord is asserting before the Jews his divine nature, that he is the Messiah. He is the one that they have all been waiting for and that his mission on earth is to do the will of his Father, okay? to do the will of God the Father. So we will read the uh, last portion of this and comment on it. And our Lord, talking to the Jews, says to them, when you lift up the son, of, the son of Man, then you will realize that I am. When you lift up the Son of Man, you will realize that I am. I am who? I am what? Okay? And it's, it's written here in capital letters. The letter I and the A-M. I am in capital letters. Okay? When was the first time we heard the words, I am, in the Bible? Do you remember? Shabel? you remember? When was the first time that the Jews, in fact, heard the, the words or the way that God referred to himself as I am? Do you recall? Huh? What? With Moses, Shabel. Very good. Where? Where did God reveal himself as I am? The burning bush. That's right. Right? When our Lord, well, sorry, when, G, when Moses came up to the burning bush and he, he was being told by, by God speaking through the, the burning bush, right? To go back to Egypt and you know, rescue the uh, the Jewish people, and when when Moses tried to ask him, well, "Who who am I gonna tell them who sent me?" and God said, "Well, tell them that I am sent you. I am right." And uh, of course, the, the those two words, "I am," have very deeply philosophical uh, meanings and theological as well. Right, uh, that the what 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 I am really mean means. I mean, as far as we can understand, is that he was saying he is eternal. It's it's talking about the eternal nature of God. That he had no beginning, he had no end. He has always been God. I am. I always am. I always exist. I always existed. I always have the fullness of being. The fullness of everything is in me, right? I am. That's exactly what our Lord says here again. When, you, when I'm lifted up, okay, when you lift up the Son of Man, then you will realize that I am. Right? Why is he saying it here? I am. 
You know why? Because, because what does the lifting up mean here? What is he talking about when he says, when you lift up the Son of Man? Lift up where? How? Anybody? On the cross, Joseph, right? When you lift up the Son of Man on the cross, then you will realize that I am. What? Because, why? Because, because that is the culmination of the mission that Jesus Christ came to earth for. That was the reason of his birth. That's the reason of his preaching, his life. And that's going to be the reason for his entire being, for, he, for who he is, right? He is the I am. And the, the, his own crucifixion where he laid down his life for our salvation. And after that, he will take that back life, uh, the, the life back. Okay. I have the power to lay down my life and take it back again. See? So he is talking about the resurrection. And who else has that power to give up his life, his earthly life, and then take it back and resurrect himself without the intervention of anybody? See? Only he who possesses the fullness of life can do that. Only he who created all life to begin with can do that. See? So after you raise him up, see? after the crucifixion, then you will realize that I am actually God. That I was the one who spoke to Moses to release you, rescue you from the Egyptians. I am. Because I have the power to lay down my life for my friends in order to save you. And I also have the power to take my life back and resurrect from the dead. Okay? So he was telling the Jews, just wait. Just wait. Once you lift up the Son of Man on that cross, you're going to see the power of God. The real power of God. Right? Resurrecting himself. Greater than all the other miracles and proofs that he has shown the Jews. Right? He has resurrected other people from the dead. He has cured other people from their diseases. Right? We got a little background music playing here, courtesy of Ava. <laughs> but no one else, no one except him, could take back his life, could take resurrect from the dead. And that's exactly what he is about to demonstrate to all of them. Right? Okay, and therefore, through the whole process of the crucifixion, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, okay, everything about Jesus would unfold. Everything now about Jesus, the real mystery behind Jesus is now going to be revealed. Okay? Now going to be revealed. Okay. Now, we continue reading this part of the gospel. It continues by saying, In that I do nothing on my own, but I say only what the Father taught me. I say only what the Father taught me. The one who sent me is with me. Okay? And again, another assertion. Okay, our Lord is asserting the fact that the one who sent me is with me. That we are actually one. Okay? That the Father and I are one, as he himself said in another gospel. Right? So he is asserting the fact that the Father and he are one. They are one and the same. Okay? He has not left me alone. He has not left me alone. Okay, I'm always with the Father. I'm always in touch with the Father. He, the Father and I are one. He has not left me alone. And why? Why has He not left me alone? Here's the answer. Because I always do what is pleasing to Him. Beautiful. The Father has never left me alone because I always do what is pleasing to Him. 
to him. There seems to be a very practical application here from our Lord's own words that we can apply to ourselves. Do we not want God to abandon us? Do we want God to always be with us? Do we want God to always abide with us? Do we always want God to protect us? Do we always want God to provide for us? What do we do? We imitate Jesus, who only does what pleases God. Right? If we want to abide, to be in God's good graces, if we want to be friends with God, if we want to be good children of God, then we always have to do what is pleasing to our Father God. The same way that Jesus has always done only what pleases the Father. So some good questions, practical questions to ask ourselves all the time would be the following. Am I doing the will of God at every moment of the day? We have to ask ourselves that question all the time. Am I doing the will of God now? Am I doing what God is expecting me to do? Now, now, right now, in this moment, at 9 o'clock in the morning or 8.30 or whatever time it is, 12 noon or whatever, am I doing what God wants me to do at this hour, at this moment? Or am I engaged in just doing my own fancy? doing my own thing because I want to please myself. And I'm not doing my duty. I'm not doing my obligation that will be for the good of others and be pleasing to God. Am I doing what is pleasing to God? In other words, okay, I may be doing what I'm doing now, like doing my studies, but am I doing it in a way that will be pleasing to God? Or am I doing my schoolwork just for the heck of it, just because I have to? Or am I doing it very well because I want to do it to honor God, to please God with what I am doing? I may be washing the dishes, sweeping the floor, cleaning the table, but am I just doing it yeah, because it's my chore to do? Or because we want to do it in order to please God. Because that is what is expected of us at that moment. But yes, it, we are also expected to do it very well. And not because we just want to appear goody-goody. And want to appear like we're doing something good. No, all of those motives are bad. The only real motive that is worth doing what we are doing for is to give glory to God, to be pleasing to God, to do the kind of work that is pleasing to God. Anything worth doing is worth doing extraordinarily well. Okay? Keep that in mind all the time. Anything worth doing is worth doing extraordinarily well. Third question. If I am not doing the will of God right now, and I am not doing it in a way that is pleasing to God, well, what can I do otherwise? How could I improve this? How could I do this better? Right? Instead of just continuing the drudgery of, okay, I'm just going to keep doing this because I don't really understand why I have to do it. <laughs> or I'm just doing this because I'm told. Okay, catch yourself. Stop. At that moment, stop. Catch yourself and stop and ask yourself, okay, wait a minute. 
Yeah, I may be doing my chores now. Yeah, I may be studying, but I'm not doing the best I can. I'm not giving it my best effort. I'm not putting in. What, what is expected of me? So how can I stop this? And how can I do better in this? Okay. How can I do it better? So let's ask ourselves these three questions all the time. When, whenever we, you know, before we start doing something, while we are doing it, and even afterwards. That's why in the examination of conscience, what do we ask ourselves? How did I love today? How did I serve today? See, we're trying to look back on our day. Basically, all of those questions we ask in the examination of conscience all boil down to one thing. And what is that? Did I do the will of God today? Did I do the will of God today? And what's the secret? What is the secret of doing the will of God doing what is expected of us at every moment, and doing things extraordinarily well. What is the secret to doing all of this? Anybody? Huh? Well, obeying wholeheartedly, yes. Well, obeying your parents is a good way to start, Joe. Because your parents are the ones who laid out what you need to do during the day, right? Your parents are like, you know, the ones who provide you your schedule and your, and your tools and, 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 and abilities and whatever it is. Environment to be able to do the will of God, right? Every day. From your chores to your school work to attending mass and doing our uh, uh, pious uh, practices. But there is one key secret in doing the will of God all the time, in doing what we need to do very well, extraordinarily well. And the secret is in the first question of our examination of conscience at night. See? The question, how did I love today? How did I love today? And if you, if you just are paying attention, those are the same questions, the same, the same mottos we have posted in the bedrooms and, and in our bathrooms, right? I'm ready to love, serve. What else? Huh? Care and excel today. See? We remind ourselves as soon as we wake up in the morning, right? When you look at the mirror in your bathroom or in your bedrooms, right? You have those questions. I'm ready to love, to serve, to care, and to excel today, right? Because that, all of that is what it takes to doing the will of God every day of our lives. But the number one requirement there is love. Are we ready to love? So that we can do the will of God. So that we can do what God expects of us to do during the day. Okay? And then at the end of the day, we ask ourselves the same question during the examination of conscience. Well, how did I love today? A love that extends and manifests itself in the way we serve, in the way we care, and in the way we excel in doing things for the day. Okay? Those are the expressions of the love that we should have put in our everyday activities. Okay? So let's be reminded of these things and uh, today in uh, you know, this gospel that we're about to read at Mass today is all about this, this theme of doing the will of God so that we remain pleasing to God and we do only what is pleasing to God. Okay? And we ask ourselves those questions. Am I doing the will of God? Am I doing what I'm expected to do extraordinarily well? And if I'm not doing it, well, what can I do to change things? 
What can I do to improve things? And the bottom line of all of this is love. Love. If you love God, you will always strive to do what is pleasing to the one you love. Okay? You wouldn't want to offend the one you love by not doing what is pleasing to them. So what more with God? If we want to and sincerely love God, then we will always do what's pleasing in the eyes of God. Okay? That's it. That's it for us. We're ready for Mass. We uh, ended a little earlier. That's good. Okay. Bye-bye, everybody. Have a good day. Bye. Bye. Where is Ava? We don't have Ava now. Okay. Hope to see all of you again tomorrow, folks. Have a good day. And please don't forget to like this Facebook post. Like the page, uh, Catholic Praxis. Uh, on Facebook and on YouTube for now, and we'll see wherever, where, wherever else we can put these videos. Um, a lot of people have expressed their um, interest in this, that they, they're learning a lot, apparently, and we're sharing our own family experience of learning the gospel messages uh, for our own lives and how we can put all of the gospel uh, message into practical uh, application in our own lives so spread the word if you want to help others see you again tomorrow hopefully bye bye, bye. bye.